By listening to this podcast, you agree to not use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition in yourself or others, including, but not limited to, patients that you are treating. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Neuroendocrine Cancer Awareness Network be responsible for damages arising from use of this podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another live stream Q&A here with NCAN. I am your host, uh, Mike Wayman from NCAN. Uh, today, we're going to be covering nutrition, net nutrition, and I'm super excited to have somebody who's been a part of our family for many, many years. We've gotten to work with her for a long, long time. Uh, registered dietitian, Leanne Burns. Leanne, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's, for- it's just a privilege to be with y'all. It just, it's like fun, fun family thing to be, to be back and speaking with you. So I'm really excited to be here this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, everybody, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to field some questions to Leanne, uh, about net nutrition, a couple of things before we get into, uh, into it. Um, any questions you have put, post them in the comment section. Uh, we're going to get to every single one that we possibly can. Uh, if you're new to the NCAN YouTube page, please make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, we're actually going to be putting up a, a little uh, form to fill out. So this way you guys can, uh, can learn about the latest Q and A's and the latest podcasts that we have coming together. So um, stay tuned for all of that. And uh, yeah, so Leanne, uh, I, think, I think the best place to start is to, to kind of give a little bit of background on yourself of course we know and uh anybody who's been on the page knows because we've got several of your talks uh, on there but well, yeah I'll just uh, probably still, a little bit i may still have been dark-headed then so they may not recognize this uh this, <laughs> this uh, uh, older look because uh i did uh, i did the post uh post covid uh no no dying anymore so i'm pretty gray-headed now but um i can tell you a little <laughs> bit about myself um I was with LSU Medical School in New Orleans for um, many, many years, uh, about 13 years in New Orleans, 27 overall as faculty for the medical school. But I was honored, I, I was I had privilege to work with uh, the group in uh, that functioned in the neuroendocrine tumor clinic down in Kenner. Um, and p- before that, I was with Dr. Anthony, Lowell Anthony. Um, when I first came down to New Orleans, starting in 2002, gosh, I'm old. And uh, so when I did that, I was introduced to uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Back then, we just called it, most of it carcinoid. And um, I knew from the get, uh, you know, from the start of taking care of patients with him and practice that uh, carcinoid patients' nutrition was different than the other types of tumors in many ways and the tolerances and intolerance to a uh, diet and absorption um, had to be adjusted a little bit different. So what, there was no nothing written in stone at that time. There were no great examples. So, um, but, but there were some great teachers, some great leaders in our field. And one of them was Monica uh, Warren and uh, Warner. And y'all may have met or heard of things course. from her and her information through the years. But she's kind of really set the president um, study for our field um, with her husband in practice. We, uh, uh, Dr. Warner's. Well, with just a wealth of information and still has been just such a support person um, through his time. And she did the same thing. And But I was honored to work with her when she, prior to her death, in, um, and really get a beginning of, uh, of kind of where we are now. Um, not a lot's changed. I think we've learned things and, and, and practiced, but um, she had a pretty good grip on what we needed to do. And I was able to follow in her footsteps and take that into um, a a component where I was able to work with uh, patients in clinic for years um, in New Orleans and um, about 15 years. And then um, I was able to work for some of the pharmaceutical groups through the years and help develop nutritional education material. So much of the material that was presented through these years uh, started back in the real 
problems of carcinoid syndrome before we had some of these better medicines. And, um, and I kind of authored a lot of that as well. So uh, good and bad, there's pros and cons to it now. But and we can talk about that today. So, uh, but that's a little bit of my background. I've been doing, I've been working in carcinoid cancer since uh, 2002. So uh, that's what, 20, 22 years, long time. Long time. I've enjoyed it. The good thing about it is I have the same people and the same faces for many, 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 many years. I mean, we're 20 <laughs> years down the road together. So this is the real privilege of, of working with people in this area, in this field. That's great. That's great. Yeah, we, we, we love having you. And, and uh, I think nutrition is super, super important uh, when it comes to uh, any disease, um, especially net and it's you know especially when you're dealing with uh, the gut and you're dealing with the digestive system and all that kind of stuff there are other st other things in involved but also you know they're very yeah. much uh, basic nutrition i mean just uh, having people absorb absorb and, and absorb the nutrients that they need sometimes just consuming them in the world of neuroendocrine is not enough it's make get, choosing the right thing so that you absorb the nutrients your body that your body is able to do so um everybody's a little bit different in the neuroendocrine world so we had to kind of uh, adjust foods uh accordingly so yeah we do change yeah. a few things so uh we we've got some people chiming in okay. here we've got uh we've got somebody from from australia we've got wow. uh people from uh knoxville tennessee okay. um our first question, though, we have from Tom Wilson. Uh, any tips for short bowel and functional nets with significant diarrhea? Uh, okay. Weight is 115 to 120 pounds, uh, five foot five, small gut mets to the liver, and uh, also has carcinoid heart disease and bad bowel. Okay. Um, yes, there, there, I have, um, I've been working, this is something that is, um, it's a hard um, problem for mal for or a problem that you see a lot of malabsorption. So there are there's a diet that I worked with, kind of put together years ago, and I call it the rapid transit diet. And um, Mike, I don't mind sending it to you, and if okay. you don't mind, I authored it. You know, there's we, yeah, it's mine, and you can post it on the on the thing later, uh, so people oh, can wow. review it. Uh, I don't mind. I, in an educational world, I can't cut it down to everything you need, but I can do education. <laughs> so this is education. But I'm going to give you a couple of steps that will help you. And what we use is what we kind of call this, used to be called a dumping syndrome that we had more gut problems with, but it really is the same thing in this area where we separate the liquids that you consume from the solids by 30 to 45 minutes, and it makes a lot of difference. You also need to do uh, liquids that are not concentrated in sugar. And um, some of the high concentrated sugars are going to make your things go through your GI tract too fast. It's not going to absorb well, and it'll cause you to have some diarrhea. Um, there are um, pancreatic enzymes um, may play a big part in this. So go to your physicians if, if you're having fatty foul stools um, and ask um, for some, some help in, in adjusting those. Several medicines that we use in malabsorption through the years that have been very helpful and deciding especially with these short guts um or if you've had your gallbladder taken out as well sometimes it's a double triple whammy but um we try to reduce the amount of fat we want you to consume fats but it, sometimes it needs to be from medium chain triglycerides that's a coconut oil kind of base uh, because it absorbs differently than the um other types of fat. We don't you go, want you to go too low in, in any nutrient. We want a well-balanced nutrient. We want to have leaner meats because it's usually the fat. Some of the fats um, are not tolerated well, depending on which medications you're on, and also with this these surgeries. Um, so you're going to need more starches, and it doesn't have to be. We Sometimes we get caught up in this healthy world, and for carcinoid patients and neuroendocrine patients that have had especially these bowel surgeries, healthy is what your body absorbs. And that may be, the, that's going to be the things that are usually soluble fibers in the inside of the fruits and vegetables and not all that tough skin. Those tough skins are hard to digest and they tend to push through the GI tract and increase the diarrhea. So um, easy to absorb um, nutrients. I, I'm from the South. <clears throat> you can tell by this <laughs> accent. I live down close to New Orleans and rice, rice is very easy to, to absorb. And it also has a great 
electrolyte. Um, if you boil rice and drink rice water um, uh, to, as a fluid replacement, that's helpful. So if you haven't tried something like that, nobody's run that by you. Look for um, the um, how to make rice milk, and that can help you it's, uh, with your fluids. There's a couple. I'm not sure if this person's from Knoxville or from Australia, but there's a couple of um, uh, supplements that we're uh, using pretty successfully now as well. Um, if you can uh, have access to them. Um, um, and I hope you're seeing a, a, a nutritionist uh, or some, if you're not, um, it's, we don't, we're not easy to find sometimes. Um, but make sure that you, if you're using things like electrolyte replacements, anybody has um, the Gatorade type things, I don't want to push it with that type of thing. Um, make sure you're diluting it. It needs to be mixed one part of liquid to about three part, two parts of water. Um, the osmolality, these things are just too concentrated for your GI tract, and it just increases more diarrhea. Um, again, back to the medicines. Um, if you're having a floaty foul stool, um, you know, talk to your physicians and see if you're having, a, get, uh, they can check to see if you're having some pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. And if you're having that, they can order enzymes to help you. You can get anim, uh, plant-based enzymes, and some people think, you know, have had success with these. They don't have as much lipase, and lipase is the enzyme that digests fats. So it, it's, it's many times it doesn't have the concentration you need in what we use in higher doses of these pancreatic enzymes. Um, they um, they have to need to be ordered by your by prescription uh, if you're using the um, the pharmaceutical ones. But they are they've very, been very successful in practice and very successful in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, patients in management of diarrhea. Also, um, it might be bile salt. Sometimes we have a kind of a sudden urge diarrhea, um, kind of a yellow tinge you'll see, and it can burn your bottom. And that's usually a bile, B-I-L-E, I'm very Southern, bile, bile salt. And that's because those salts, bile salts are not absorbed before they get to the colon. And this causes a real urgent stool, somewhat uncontrolled. And these are the ones that get you caught off guard. And uh, sometimes when you're not ready and not in the right place. So, um, so those are a couple of different types of diarrhea. I think that um, back in the day, I had a nickname of the queen of poop. And, but in practice, I was pretty good at deciding what type of diarrhea or the biggest cause of your diarrhea just by listening to your story pretty well. And then I would help uh, work with my uh, surgeons and physicians uh, and uh, uh, to, to determine which, which medicines we thought were best. But there are some options, so you do not have to live with it. I mean, there are things you can do. But diet-wise, we're going to use lean proteins, complex carbohydrates that are come from soluble fibers, which is the inside of the fruits and vegetables and the starches. And in this case, the white rice and the white noodles and the white bread is fine. We don't want to get too much in, so that we improve, increase inflammation in your body. I mean, chronically, but dear, but it's more important that you absorb the nutrients. I'm big on potatoes and rice. Uh, those are two really wonderful nutrients. Potatoes get a bad rap. They're really a wonderful nutrient uh, based uh, vegetable and starch together calorie protein dense it D is important so we can also use some other things like quinoa quinoa is a good um a grain uh and it's usually easy to absorb um we try to reduce the fat um uh, from you know from uh long chain fats um and oils we use more medium chain triglycerides there's like i said there's a couple of formulas and um supplements and, and mike i'll give you these i'm not going to try to say anything online but I'll give you resources for all this <laughs> sure, stuff sure. and when we go back um and uh and new things coming out all the time uh there's uh some of these uh and there's a new um electrolyte replacement kind of thing uh that came out this year and i and of course I, i'll send you the name on it too but it has a maltodextrin uh base and i like it as well so there are some there are some supplements that are helpful but it's not usually the old-fashioned things like insure these things have too much sugar too much fat and they're not tolerated well and um they uh and you need to go to something that um is is much easier to tolerate uh rice based drinks um some um sometimes dairy is a little hard to absorb but go to la lo low fat dairy if you can um using dairy usually can help but the main thing is to separate those liquids from your solids by 30 to 45 minutes in between. And when you're eating, just take sips of water, just small sips, 
that uh, and let that um, and separate those things and no and stay off of concentrated sugars and those are going to be your colas and your regular cold drinks, uh, fruit juices. Over anything that has more than 12 grams, when you're looking at the label, 12 grams of sugar is usually not tolerated well. Those things need to be diluted before you consume them. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, next question comes from uh, Alicia Christensen. Uh, she's, uh, she's asking any dietary information or, uh, I guess, suggestions for a person getting Lutathera PRRT? Well, about the treatments, these treatments, um, it depends on what symptoms you're having. If we're having people that are having um, treatment and getting nauseated, then um, and sometimes um, losing weight or just lose their appetite after these treatments, we usually work with just the symptoms that you're having. So there's not an overall cover for what you really need to do um, prior to you know any treatment. Make sure you're stay on a um, a pretty healthy diet and eat well, um, and um, don't overeat or don't surely don't undereat. There's um, some diets we just think do better through research. I worked with a um, group of dietitians, and I'm gonna have to read the. Uh -oh, I'm gonna have to read the name of it because I can't even tell you off the top of my head. But I worked with a group of uh, dietitians out of Europe that had worked with neuroendocrine tumors as well, and have a little bit different aspects. And and we all come from different great backgrounds, so. Um, but the research that they have really gathered in Europe and areas that are a little bit better than we have is that um, plant-based diets do tend to, uh, to do better. Um, not, not vegetarian, no, not getting away from all the meat and eggs and all that, but just as a, you know, more plant-based and fruits and vegetables that you can tolerate. We talked a little bit about we have to alter them a little bit. We take the skins off. We may need to steam things and not eat raw. Sometimes raw food, uh, vegetables can... Um, can you know really not be tolerated very well uh, and can cause we don't want anything that has too much insoluble fiber after surgery because we don't I keep dropping my books down here um, <laughs> uh, uh, you don't want to cause obstructions small bowel obstructions things can just get st stuck where you've had those surgeries and they put you back together you have these little mastomosis in there that we don't want to get stuck so we're really careful with our fibers um, but these um but so there's not so if you if you had the treatment and you're um and you're having nausea then um we really watch the color of your foods we try to do things that are real bland in color like white and yellow and get away from things that are colorful because the same foods that make things look good color smell uh those things the same thing that cause nausea to, to react so we usually use uh, like bananas and even the colas you would pour into, you know, so you can't see the color. You don't want to see a red can or something, you know, you really be careful with colors and more bland. Um, we do small amounts, small amounts, six times a day. We do not try to do any big meals, but we put something in your stomach, a little something in your stomach six sure. times a day. So you're never completely um, um empty we do not want you to totally empty that's so the same thing here um and then if you're losing weight um we need to increase calories uh, and again we can kind of do it by increasing these little feedings and and have more snacky foods through the day that you may tolerate instead of heavy cooked food sometimes that's problematic as well sometimes um I don't think some of the other symptoms we've seen through the years. If you, if you, sometimes when you mess with the liver, and I know we've got several exciting new treat, treatments and ways to address the liver now, and, and I haven't had a lot of experience with uh, patients that have done it yet because I think it's fairly new. And I just, I'm, but I watch her feedback on the different support groups, and so anything that people tell me, and as people go through it, the more y'all feedback, it'll help uh, people like me as a dietitian understand how to to get these symptoms uh, back under control. But one thing about when you're working with the liver or you're doing things with the liver, you can really aggravate it and get, and when you aggravate it, it really gets to cut and breaking down calories, uh, using up a lot of calories, breaking down protein pretty quick. And you can lose a lot of weight real fast, 10% of your body weight, especially with surgeries, um, pretty rapidly. And I, I had a different type of tumor in my liver, but the same thing, same neuroendocrine surgeon did it. And um, even myself experienced that. And, and that you don't have an appetite and um, lost 15 pounds in a matter of like two weeks. So they can, it can happen. So the most important thing is that you just keep putting something in your mouth every two to three hours. 
um, that are easy to tolerate. And we talked about, you know, uh, real, you know, softer foods, lower in fiber from soluble, you know, skins. Don't think it has to all be the healthiest food. Don't fried foods are not tolerated very well because they leave your stomach so late and you don't usually have enough pancreatic enzymes to digest them. So usually debaked and broiled foods tend to do better. Um, separate it. I said have people separate that liquid out and uh, still um, make sure you're getting plenty of fluid though. Um, that, I think that that's a problem we see. It's just not getting enough fluid overall and get behind on your fluids um, that will sometimes send you back to the hospital to get IVs. So. Sure. sure. Is that it? Um, so uh, I, th there's been a little bit of talk here in the chat about uh, small meals and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm obviously from this. What's that? Want, what, what's a small, small, or they want to well, know what it is I, small meal? I think, I, I think, uh, yeah. So some people are asking, uh, I've heard about small meals being important and stuff like that. Uh, I think the two, the two things that uh, I think should be, probably be addressed and probably would make this question a little bit easier because we do know based on what you just said, small meals are very important. Um, what, what are some things, you know, obviously it's not a blanket statement for everybody. Everybody's different sizes, different weights, different you know, metabolisms, all that. But what would you consider right. a good small meal? And, you know, somebody in here I said, say I'm, I'm still mostly three meals a day, but snacks in between. Um, what do you think should, what do you think should so, be the breakdown? Okay, so with a normal meal, let's just go through. I'm, I'm an old dietitian. I can teach this one. So when we're talking about a plate of food for um, for a normal meal, we're talking about a nine-inch plate. Let me get over here, nine-inch plate. And we have three ounces of meat, three to four ounces of meat. It'd be like one to three on your plate if it was a clock. Mm -hmm. And then you usually have uh, two to three sections with starch and breads. And then a fruit, ideally a fruit. So you're going to have, and then vegetables. So if you're going to do that, you kind of kind of think, well, I'm going to need about half of it. So really about one of uh, one to two ounces of meat of a protein, a lean protein. Um, and so uh, just to give you an example, what one ounce is, um, if you use to deli meat, because I think it's just the easiest way to explain it. One slice of deli meat is one ounce. Okay. okay. So that's, that, that tells you that's just one ounce. So you don't have to put one egg is considered about one ounce. And eggs can be used, and eggs can be very healthy for us. Remember, the yolk is where the fat is. So if you're using pancreatic enzymes and things like that, you're going to have to use them even with eggs because you get fat with your with your egg yolks. But egg whites tend to be tolerated really well. Um, they can be gassy. Now, I'm going to say eggs are gassy, so be a little careful with that because gas mm -hmm. is a big thing. Um, being active and moving around after meals is, is important so that you're not sitting and building that gas up because that can be real troublesome as well. Um uh, so I would do, I, I tell people a good example of a, of a, of a, of a, a san, um, a small meal. It's like the, we used to call them fold over sandwiches, you know, take one mm -hmm. piece of bread, put the meat in, so fold it over. Yep. So, so a little half a bread, half a sandwich, and then about a half a cup of, um, sometimes a fruit, uh, can be, you know, half a banana, okay. um, it's something like that. If you're doing nuts, if you're still where you can chew nuts and stuff or peanut butter on that, that would be a good protein. Um, even with your banana, uh, cereal with a little bit of uh, soft fruit with it can do it. So about, you know, about half as much as you would use on a regular meal, considering a meal would be three to four ounces. That's a normal meal. And then two selections of starch, you know, it's enough to make a sandwich, right? Two pieces of bread mm -hmm. or a roll and potatoes. And then about half a cup of vegetables, dairy, yogurt. Yogurt's another one. You can use yogurt as snacks. It's a sure. wonderful snack. Um, and, um, and then our fruits, you know, and we can use a lot of soft fruits as well. So instead of selecting four starches with a meal, you're going to do two. And instead of using three to four ounces of your meat, you're going to use one to two. So that's, that kind of gives you about half as much. Does that now, help? Yes. Yeah. And, and now for the people, because I'm sure you get this. I'm sure you've gotten this before. Um for the people that say, oh, I know I should be doing this and stuff. I just, my life is just very busy. I'm on the go. I'm this, I'm that. What, what do you usually recommend to them to, to keep track of it? Cause, cause it is very important. It, it is. I, I, and, um, it's plan ahead, plan ahead. If you wait till tomorrow, decide what you're going to eat. When you get hungry, you're going to be wrong every time. 
nearly. And you end up with things that smell good. If you're hungry, fried chicken's going to smell better than baked chicken. You have to, you know, you're not going to smell that. And that's sure. baked chicken would be a better selection for you. So you have to plan ahead. Even though we're busy, take enough time to, even if you don't have to go get it and put it, you have to think ahead in your mind. This is what I'm going to eat for tomorrow for lunch. That organization is going to make all the difference in your lifestyle. Just know where you're going to eat and about what you're going to eat. Try not to make those last minute selections. And some of these can be not too bad. Um, wraps, you know, making wraps that you can carry with you. Sandwiches, we talked about that already. Um, there are some people that are doing, you know, do fine on lettuce. Uh, people don't like iceberg lettuce, but for people that have to intolerance, sometimes that may be the best choice for you. Um, I don't push a lot of greens uh, in people after surgery, so I'm, I'm a little careful with that. But um, tuna fish salads uh, that you can, you know, put with crackers. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be complicated meals. There's, you do not have to do sit down. And use, um, if you have good sources of rotisserie chickens, you know, if you have good sources yeah. of things like that, use them. Um, <clears throat> use the, the uh, we use you get fatigued, but it's supposed to be cooking. So even, we buy things already chopped, you know, don't, don't try to chop up a bell pepper. If you can buy frozen, you know, chops, it's already chopped for you. Go ahead and use those things. It helps save you time and uh, then fatigue of doing, doing those things. Um, let people help you. A lot of times people want to, you know, offer you something, tell them, well, this is what I eat. If you'd like to bring some, you know, you know, something, potato soup, something that you may like, then let them bring it. But do tell them that, you know, I, but I'm kind of hard. You know, don't put much, you know, you have to be honest. These are people, these have to be people that are willing to do it your way so that they don't put all the fat in the cooking. But sure. um, the, uh, the baked potatoes are easy, easy. You can carry them with you in your purse. <laughs> you know, get a microwave, <laughs> do them, you know, four minutes. You know, so that it does not have to be a complicated meal. Um, but you need to plan ahead. And there are a sure. few foods that you, you know, and you're going to get away from home and have to make selections in uh, restaurants. And you're going to have to make selections probably in some of our faster foods. Um, so look for foods that are um, the less processed. Processed foods have a lot of um, concerns for dietitians and everybody. Because a lot of times these are made out of foods that are um, have a lot of preservatives and a lot of additives and sometimes MSG, which we know is problematic um, for flushing and different things as well. It's just there, these things are probably we need to use as last resort. Um, yeah. Try to do more fresh when we can. Um, but look for things that are don't have cream sauces. Use things mm -hmm. that are more broth based. If you're going to make a soup selection, use a broth based uh, soup and not a cream based soup. Um, use um, Instead of um, you know, instead of using butter sauces, you may have to use just like lemon squeeze. Learn to make some, uh, some more sauces out of just the the fresher vegetable and fruits and things, and not use um, all the butter. The butter sauces and cream sauces, you know, if it says something like that, use individual, um, you know, a broiled chicken breast. You know, use the most simple form of. Um, a food that you can. If you're going to eat something like a steak, make sure it's very lean. Um, steak it takes a lot of acid to digest, and so it, sometimes it's hard. And if it's grisly, it's really hard. So we want you to have a lean cut. And lean is loin. If it's a sirloin, tenderloin, or round, eye round, top round, they're lean. So there's some lean cuts there, and that's pork or beef. Mm -hmm. And um, these, uh, but that gives you selections and the little tender loin, even pork loin, yeah. little, those things are going to be healthier choices as well. But broth base is always going to be your best choice for sauces um, uh, over anything that's creamy. So that and um, stay away from mayonnaise because remember it's a fat. So try to, if you're doing something like a sandwich, maybe more mustard, something with flavor and less mayonnaise and fats on it. Okay. That awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All this helps. All this helps. Um, earlier, you mentioned about um, the milk substitute kind of thing. Uh, so, Ann Dabs here has a question regarding your opinion on uh, almond milk as a substitute for cow's milk. Um, she. Uh, oh, I think it's yeah. No, that's a good choice. It, it's and that's, well. It that's is. That's also good. with uh, small bowel primary with carcinoids yeah, in yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, almond milk's fine, um, and it works well. 
and we've had real good results with it. And uh, now it's not going to give you the, you know, unless it's fortified with calcium, it's not going to give you the same nutrients, but it definitely can be used in the same places that we use it. It works real well. And, um, and I'm a, I'm a fan of, uh, of uh, making like a slushy smoothie things, but you need to make them with the things that you tolerate. And uh, almond milk is one of those things that you can add as a, as a liquid base to something like, you know, use your banana or, you know, some people flush with bananas. So I hate to use it as an example, but not everybody does. But, um, but peaches or something, you can add that and make you a good little uh, smoothie. But uh, yeah, almond milk's fine. Works well. Perfect. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> Paula Hart has a question regarding uh, tuna. Um, how many servings of tuna per week is safe for net patients? Yeah, they stay in around um, they want to stay around two to three. Um, I think it's uh, it's kind of still where we're we're staying around on tuna. Um, and if you use can now that's that I think even canned tuna we think a little bit different than even our fresh tuna, but we're still watching uh, source, you know, watch your sources of it. That's you know where you where they got it from kinda. But yeah, they're still worried uh, about fish in general with mercury and things like that. So that's why we got a restriction too. Um <clears throat> Sorry, I, this is my second talk of the day, so I'm about to lose. <laughs> it's very rare that I lose my voice. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, yeah, we're still limited in it. Um, but you can try some different types of fish and um, and and still make some flaky, good, you know, dishes. But, um, but yeah, I'd, I'd hold it down, usually two to three. Uh, and it may be less if you're pregnant, you're going, anybody with us going through a pregnancy. Sure, you know, yeah. A little bit more control. Um, also had a question in here about, um, are there any studies or particular foods or nutritional regimens that might delay or, uh, eliminate the growth of tumors? Uh, no, we don't, no, there's no literature out that I'm aware of that has shown any reduction in anything or growth or anything with neuroendocrine that's really related to what happens with the diet. I get asked a lot of times because in literature and I wrote the literature, um, we were worried about flushing and syndrome and the sudden diarrhea and the things mm -hmm. where we're having trouble with that. And we restricted some foods um, that uh, from syndrome that uh, is uh, if, it, if you're not having syndrome, you don't have to watch those foods. So I think that right. sometimes we overkill. Uh, I did. I mean, I, I admit it. I think we did an overkill on some of this. So you need if you're not having the flushing and the urgent uh rush and of diarrhea after um the smoked foods the you know the, well, i'm really not crazy about any of those real prepared foods because we know that these foods can affect you even colon cancer and and not you know those things it's still you know an issue and a risk but like the, some of the aging you know some people were real uh real, real sensitive to things avocados anything that gets soft when it ages bananas things that have that serotonin release um, uh, from, um, well, it's not direct serotonin, but indirectly, um, then we, we really had to entire mean the, the, the aging process of these things, um, tyrosine, histamine, a lot of histamine release in these, uh, in these aging process, these foods, but not everybody is sensitive to them. And if you're not sensitive to them, they're not going to make a difference in the growth of tumor. That's not where we're avoiding it. We're avoiding them because of the symptoms that they create for patients with carcinoid syndrome. And so they, they were never meant to be something that is going to change growth, not to our knowledge. And I don't think, and I know, if, I know Mary Ann's around, she's probably back there somewhere. She can tell me real quick if she's seen it or heard it because she stays as current with this as anybody. But, um, but no, I don't, it's, it, I don't think we know it, um, exactly um, what, you know. But I do know that if I was going to take people off things, I would take what we know to what we know for all cancers, and that's the additives, the preservatives, um, the foods that are caught, uh, cooked at real high temperatures um, that cause these um, car uh, carcinogenics, um, heterocyclic, uh, heter heterocyclic, yeah, amines. Um, so those things I think I would be careful with still, and no matter what type of cancer you had, you know, or, or to prevent cancer overall, because we know that that is involved with, um, especially in colon cancer. Um, sure. So I think that there are some things that we, we just, but not, no, not that I hope somebody finds it one day, but to my knowledge, I don't have one food or certain item that prevents um, directly anything. Specific. Yeah. All right. 
Okay. Um, I, I've had a couple of comments in here uh, regarding, um, you know, just different dietary uh, things. And I think if, if we've learned nothing from net patients and net treatments and stuff, there is no set way. Um, we've had, we have somebody, um, somebody who said that they can eat anything they want uh, and not have issues that they're aware of, or, you know, he said maybe he's ignorant to it. Um, is there like a, a, a specific blanket piece well, of information that you can we give know. to? We do, we do know patient. this, especially people that are not, that are able to absorb and have, you know, really good results, is the plant-based diet, is that Mediterranean-type diet. Uh, the research came out of Italy, uh, researchers out of Italy, oh gosh, 2021, 20, been a while back, a couple of, several years ago, when I was working on this paper. Now, I, this paper, I didn't read the thing, I do have, uh, with this paper that I wrote and the guidelines, we do have, it's called, and you can get, you can post this too, I think I've already sent it to you once, Michael, <laughs> or to uh, but it's called a dietitian developed practical guidelines for the dietary management of neuroendocrine neoplasms. So we have written something and it has how much we should believe that you should have a many nutrients and how much protein, how we figure these when we're working with dietitians and how dietitians do this. Um, so we, there is some literature here. We, we have written something up. But what we know from our review is that Italy, uh, some, um, some good research coming out of um, Italy really identified the Mediterranean diet because it's an anti-inflammatory based diet. Remember that okay. inflama inflammatory um, foods from which tend to be sugar, sugary foods, real simple, um, um, low calorie, well, they're high calorie, low nutrient, we call uh, kind of um, nutrient uh, free foods. Um, they tend to be, you know, inflammatory foods, sugars, Fats the same way. Things that are uh, processed um, tend to be that way. They, cre they create inflammation in the body. Fried foods, you know, long-chain fatty acids um, that can, you know, consume. They actually increase, you know, the um, decre can decrease your immune system. So for those reasons, we really do believe the base um, and lean meats. We know that we believe that lean meats are, are, are the best choice. Um, they... Um, the American Cancer, uh, another really good resource, as a matter of fact, the American Institute of Cancer Research, make sure I can say it right, American Institute of Cancer Research has some wonderful information if you've never looked into that area. They actually do work with foods, and um, they have some great recommendations and some work on people that are um, post, you know, post-treatment and, um, and survivorship, and they really get into a lot of the healthier foods. Um, and it used to be called, um, oh, I can't remember anymore, something plate, choose best plate. But now it's, um, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a real good one. But it, our Mediterranean diet, uh, plant, more plant-based, it doesn't have to be raw. A lot of times we really, in cooked, actually can make you absorb uh, the fat better on things that have a lot of vitamin A in them, a little bit of fat, because they're fat-soluble vitamins uh, in them. So, um so cooking foods doesn't destroy all the nutrients. So those do know that you can you can cook them down so you can tolerate. Sometimes there's foods that we just forget about, like beets, beets that mm -hmm. are good for you. They, yeah. they, you know, that we just forget to eat. So they just use a variety of foods. I say eat from a rainbow. Uh, you know the variety and the phytochemicals and these things, the antioxidants in a variety of foods uh, and fruits and vegetables tend to have those. Uh, so I think those are wonderful things to to kind of work on. And uh, right. you mentioned several times the, the Mediterranean diet. Just a, a quick overview of what, what, what that contains. And it's, it, so I, I got the best book. Where's this? Um, I probably dropped it too. Here, there's, for people that really want to get into this really deep, and I've worked on this with a couple of groups that we've done with, uh, my, um, I, I do a support group for uh, North Car uh, California once a month. And, um, but it's called the Genomic Kitchen. But it really breaks down. The, it's called the Genomic Kitchen. And the author on this is a dietitian. And she um, really did a good job of studying this. But she, um, her name was Amanda Archibald. I can send you that too, Michael. I'll send that so y'all can put on your references. <laughs> but it is called, and it breaks down really the Mediterranean diet. But a Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet uses more plant-based. It's um, more fruits and vegetables at the bottom 
and oils become, and they use a lot of oils. And, um, but what really interesting about this book is when she went back to the really where they did the origin of where these people really ate healthier, not what we've made into the Mediterranean diet, but it's really more plant again, natural plant base. Um, we know in this country, wheat's hard to absorb. Well, I got not, I guess we don't know. I guess we shouldn't say that openly. Okay. No, but we, we do know by listening to people's input that sometimes wheat products and not because of gluten necessarily, but just it's a tougher product to tolerate today than it was, you know, once upon a time. Okay. Sometimes people just don't tolerate it like they used to um, in this country uh, mm -hmm. and it can cause inflammation. But, but if we use, um, so they were able to use some more of that than we even can, but they, they kind of moved that starch and bread from the bottom of the and kind of put more fruits there, uh, vegetables, lean meat. They did more fish. And they did, they depends on their location. You know, they're, if they were close to the Mediterranean Sea, you know, they ate more fish, made sense, sure. right? Shrimps and different things like that. Um, and then um, they ate, um, they had um, goat milk, you know, they had, they did have milks and dairy, but it wasn't in the high amounts that we consume either, uh, I don't think, but at least two, you know, about twice a day and cheeses and things like that. But mostly it's, they had very clean food, they cooked their foods at home. Um, these were not processed food, not broken down, and uh, more more plant based. And that you know, fruits and vegetables, a variety of colors, and and that's really where they base theirs. Um, and then they use they use a lot of olive oil, and they um <clears throat> and the omega threes and the olive oil may very well play a big part in the um, anti inflammatory effects. So um, they didn't consume they didn't consume red wine. Uh, it, but I, that doesn't have to be consumed. And really with carcinoid alcohol, there, it can cause a lot of problems um, with flushing and, and different things. And, um, and, and there's, we know so much negative about alcohol now, so I have to be really careful about, you know, what, how people, uh, but that's between you and your physician. I'm not going to get into that because that's a big one. But we know overall that alcohol you know, increases cancers of different types not necessarily neuroendocrine tumors but of uh we do know with colon cancers and some of the other ones we, we, that are very prominent breast cancers individual so we um so that's kind of it i mean it's it's um flatbreads instead of you know raised breads um not much meat they weren't big meat eaters but a lot of that's economy based so they did a lot mm -hmm. of the they did a lot of their own hunting and fishing, so they had game, but it's um, maybe rabbit. You know, the different. You know, their access to game was different, um, but their economy is different. So what they consume was m much more home, home right. cooked. You know, homegrown, homegrown. Maybe you know more, sure. more markets. They bought from markets and things like that. Where yeah. they produced their food was very different than what we would produce. So, um, so more you know fresh and um, access to that in this country is sometimes problematic which is unfortunate. Less hands between the yep. grower yep. and the, and the consumer. Right. Much more, much more direct sure. uh, growth sure. and, and, uh, in cooking right there together. Cause they, uh, there you go. Oh no, no, you were saying, no, no, that, I was going to say, you know, even their, their, their wheat's very different from our wheat, even, you know, what they use sure. over there and in, in, in Europe is, is very different than what we consume uh, from what they say. That's what my dietitians that I worked with tell me too. <laughs> Uh, we've got another question uh, in regards to the milk, but I also do think that uh, people who are trying to get protein in their diet, it's important too, but uh, how about soy or pea proteins? Yeah, those are fine too. They are, um, both of them are fine. Uh, soy, um, it can be a little bit gassy. A few people have a little bit more trouble um, tolerating uh, soy, but um, but it's a fine product. It uh, has a lot of phytoestrogen for uh, some people like, some people are concerned with. Um, if women have breast cancer, sometimes a soy milk um, needs to be considered with your physician. It's a, a it's a, a, it's an animal. It's a, it's a um, vegetable source of a weak um, estrogen. Okay, phytoestrogen. <laughs> so if you have breast cancer or you're you know high risk, um, using soy milk probably, uh, and you're using high amounts, just talk to your physician about it, see what they think. Uh, they'll tell you what they think. And it's across the board. I have, I've worked with a lot of them and it's kind of across the board. Um, uh, many of us believe that uh, it competes for the same 
uh, cell site is the estrogen, so it actually reduces the estrogen re, um, receptin, the actual a estrogen receptin. Um, some, some, you know, but there's a lot of, you know, risk involved in any of these estrogen products. So, uh, but, but being that said, just if, if that's not your problem, then don't worry about it. Go ahead and consume it. Okay. Um, uh, I got another thing here about uh, diarrhea control. Um, is there is there any product or just mm -hmm. general diet that you could oh, I, specifically? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's what the that's what the diet that I told you I, I'm gonna give send to you so you can post, Michael. Yeah. Um, and it is based on there's a lot of things we do with diarrhea. Um, then there's a diarrhea diet. Uh, it's uh, and you can every dietitian has one. We used to um, uh, use uh, back in the day when you were young or had children, you may remember the old brat diet, which was the first diarrhea diet on the, you know, that we even con considered. And it was banana, rice, applesauce, and toast. And it's because those things are all soluble fibers and they're very easy to tolerate. So that's how that diet started because it's a fruit pectin. Fruit pectins help absorb water and especially in the colon and so um um that yes there are diarrhea diets uh but again let's go back to what i said before separate the liquid from the solid by 30 to 45 minutes that's for everybody okay that stop helps with the diarrhea tr tremendously do not drink sugary drinks cut back on the fat use lean meats use Less, you know, um, stay away from sugary fried fried foods. Uh, probably are not tolerated, especially if you're having diarrhea. Um, use the medications that are um, your physician's giving you. Uh, there's several, and they act different ways. So depending on what you cause your diarrhea, is, if it's just short bowel, then uh, something that decreases the transit time or the uh, peristalsis can be used, um, and it doesn't, you know, those are over the counter. You can take, um, and the doctor will tell you how many a day you can have, or the nerves. Um, so, check with them on that. But those um, are, we use those, uh, but you need to take them sometimes before you eat to kind of get ahead of the, you don't wait till it happens. We kind of do it ahead of time so that you can kind of uh, ward off it. If it's from a bile, bile salt, we talked about that, but B I L E is if it's a bile salt. Uh, diarrhea, you're probably going to need um, a cholestyramine um, or that type of product uh, that is a uh, bile binder, B-I-N-D-E-R. It's a bile binder, and you need a bile binder if you're having uh, pain, uh, having uh, bile salt diarrhea. Um, it's hard to stop it. I have it. Uh, I had my um, gallbladder taken out and had some issues, and um, I have kind of a leak. So I can, if I go too long without eating, kind of leaks and leaks and then when i finally eat it pushes everything through too fast and i'll have this bile salt diarrhea it happens a lot when i travel and that's why i won't go cross country to work and hardly to to speak anymore that's why this is easy <laughs> because i have malabsorption i live with malabsorption but mine's from different cause but i understand it and i understand how people have problems with it so um some of the things too is don't go a long time without eating sometimes i'll see people they're afraid they're gonna have diarrhea so they just won't eat and won't eat and won't eat well, that's the worst thing you can do. You need to eat small, like baked potatoes and, you know, make oatmeal. We do grits down here, um, rice, things that will kind of stay with you and, um, and you know, put something in your stomach. Um, and you can do it with fruits, um, soft fruits, uh, yogurts. Just put something in in little small amounts throughout the day um, and separate that liquid from the solids. Um, those things will really can help. Um reduce that that transit time but and then you and if it's fat stool if it's a floaty foul stool really foul that's how i usually tell if it's a real foul stool it's usually a fat malabsorption and you're probably going to need a pancreatic enzyme of some type probably having pancreatic insufficiency and it's very common um, because of the medications we have to use um, if you're on somatostatin uh, analogs um, just the side effect of those is a fatty stool. So you're probably going to have to have a pancreatic enzyme added. And those are um, can be you know, prescribed by your physicians. There are in the States now, I know I have some people that are from Europe, but I don't know much about their programs. But I know um, I was in a meeting with one a couple of days ago, and there are um, patient assistant programs with these pancreatic enzymes. Um, the companies give you 
coupons and stuff to make it easier for you to obtain those those drugs um, too. Um, so that those are some suggestions that I would try, and okay. I'll send you back that diet when you get a chance. Um, I, I have a, a question here. I'm going to kind of take some of the question out, but um, what is causing oily bowels? Uh, what can stop that and make it solid? I'm guessing the... the uh, Wait a minute. You, you, you stopped. I didn't hear the whole question. Tell me one more time. Oh, okay. What is causing the oily bowels? Um, what can stop that and make it solid? There's a couple of more comments here. And then want, they want to know, is Chipotle okay? Um, okay, for the first one on the oil, uh, when you do not have enough pancreatic enzymes, lipase, lipase is an enzyme that's released from your pancreas, and it helps digest fats. That is the, the, what you have to have to, do lipid, uh, to digest lipids, and that's what fats are in your body, lipids. So um, if you don't, do not have the, uh, enough Lip, uh, lipase that you don't digest the fats and so they can't get absorbed they don't break they have to um they dissipate they they break apart in the uh, as they get into the uh, small intestine they have to be broken apart and if these molecules do not digest they're not able to break apart then they get into the colon on uh, on um not broken down they're just gonna you know go straight out in your stool sure. so um so you're gonna have to have an enzyme to, to digest them or just keep what people did a long time was just kind of reduce their fats but we really needed those calories from those fats because that was real important to keeping people's weight and managing their weight and um their and that's as important as anything uh is keeping the weight and the protein status and their muscles built up so we need the fat um so we we try to do them now there's medium chain triglycerides which are we try to get people to cook you know we train people to cook with some and these are coconut oil, or pure coconut oil. It's one of them. Back in the day, you couldn't find it. It was hard for, to, to get it, but it became a fad several years ago, so it became easier to find medium-chain triglycerides. But you can come medium-chain triglycerides. They absorb differently in your body. Uh, they have a different uh, absorption, and um, they can help t uh, help with uh, absorption and get you off of the regular oils and uh, back, you know, back, uh, back into something that can help you. Uh, that um because we'd really want you to get the calories if we can now avocados tend to have they had their own lipase they, they naturally have their own lipase so there's some even though avocados are very fatty because they're a fatty vegetable uh and the serving size is the size of my finger so um not a half of one but you know slivers at a time um you can absorb them because they do make some of their own lipase so some of those you might tolerate um, but uh, it's a, it's called fat malabsorption, and I tell you the other enzyme is similar to people that are lactose intolerant. You hear about people being milk can't drink milk because they are lactose intolerant. Um, it's because they don't produce produce uh, the lactate, you know, the what they need the lact uh, to digest lactose. Okay, that's another example of a malabsorption, and we, we see that as well because these medicines block their job is to block the action of what these tumors are doing. So, but in blocking that, it blocks some of the other things it does and, and releasing some of these enzymes are part of it. So we see sometimes that become very common to have sure. what we call pancreatic insufficiency. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and Chipotle. Oh. If Chipotle, in some people, hot things make them flush. It's, so if you're having symptoms sure. of flushing and things like that, it may aggravate you, but if you don't, you know, I don't think it's not going to harm you. It, you know, it's not going to be harmful. It just may be, the tolerance may may not be good, and it could cause diarrhea. We see spicy foods cause diarrhea um, across the board. Usually, cayenne it's it's hard to tolerate. Okay, uh, I have a question here. Uh, any vitamin or food recommendations for carcinoid with severe dry itchy skin? You're, okay, so your severe dry itchy skin is because you're not absorbing fats, and so going back to well, if you might try those, some of that avocado if you can tolerate avocados because it will give you some fat. But you're, you need to absorb fat from the inside. You're not you're, you're fat malabsorbent. So um, talk to your physician or your nurse practitioner or whoever's taking care of you and, um, and maybe try some of these pancreatic enzymes, especially if you're having these flat folk, you know, fatty stools or you've really reduced your fat uh, to keep from having these symptoms. Um, 
but it's the fat, you know, the same things that we want you to, uh, you know, that you may have in trouble. Uh, those are usually things that um, will help get the, um, you know, so tr do try the coconut oil, but medium chain triglycerides, things that can, can um, lubricate from the inside. Okay. That too. Um, the, uh, but in plenty of water, making sure you're staying hydrated. Hydration is a big part of that. And it's easy to, uh, especially if you're losing weight or if you're not eating enough calories in a day, then um, glucose stores its glycogen in your cells. So if you, um, if you're not eating and your body has to get the glycogen for an energy source, the stored energy to, to keep you maintained, then guess what? It holds water with the glycogen. So as soon as it has to take the glycogen, you lose the water. So you become dehydrated. So the other thing I'm going to say is making sure you're getting enough calories in a day. Make sure you're eating uh, a, a, enough uh, so that your body, um, you know, can, can balance out. Make sure you're not uh, losing weight. And most people need about 30 calories per kilogram body weight. If you're having treatment, you might want to go up to 35. If you're overweight, go down to 25. But somewhere in that range is kind of what we use. Um, and if you're losing weight, try to reach out to uh, back out to your medical team and see if there's maybe a dietitian area. Um, and, and, and if you find a dietitian that's not familiar with neuroendocrine, I'm easy to find. And they're welcome to call me. I talk to dietitians and people I teach all the time. I love to teach. And this is something I can still offer back. So um, just tell them they can get in touch with me, you know, if they have questions as well. Sure, sure. Uh, I think we got one more question before we're going to head out here. Um, Over-the-counter papaya enzymes, do you ever recommend them? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one that tends to work. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, o Odio, uh, Odio. 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 Yeah, yeah, <laughs> love it. He would really recommend it. That was something that we really tried, um, you know, to recommend if they could not access or, and there's some people that are on restricted diets and culture, you know, and kosher and things like that. And we could get the papaya. So we try it, you know, everything. It'll, it'll definitely help you break down the starches and the amylase, you know, some of that. Um, so um, it can, if it helps, um, yeah, try it. I, I'm all for it. We, a lot of times use a combination as well. Um, some people can do fine with them. And it's enough. Just that they just need that extra little bit. So definitely try them. And papaya is a normal, natural form. So uh, that's the fruit papaya. So that's good. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Leanne, thank you very, very, very much for doing this. We really, really right. appreciate it. Right. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and everybody seems to be, uh, you know, just super grateful for, for you coming well, on and that's doing good. this. I'd love to. Uh, I, I, it's great being with everybody. I love doing this. And so we'll just, we won't be so long the next time, Michael. Absolutely. We'll do it. We'll do it again for yeah. sure. Uh, everybody watching, uh, please subscribe to the NCAN YouTube page. It helps a lot. We'll be doing a lot of these a lot more frequently. Uh, our next one's going to be in November. Uh, it's going to be on Net Cancer Day. It's going to be more than one speaker as well. So uh, stay tuned for more news on that. We'll you know sign up for, for the uh, event sign up, and we'll keep you up to date, or just make sure that you uh, subscribe to the YouTube. Um, our next event is in Nashville on the 28th of September. We have a net patient conference. Please make sure if you're in the area, come. Uh, it'll be a great time. We have a lot of amazing speakers uh, kind of headlined by Dr. Uh, Robert Ramirez from the He's great Vanderbilt guy. University. Yep. Yep. One of, one of our favorite people as well. Yes, so. Hello. It'll be, it'll be great. We have a ton of really awesome events. We've got the Tom Odoricio Award. Please uh, make sure you, you uh, submit your outstanding net physician to, uh, to nominate them. Boy, those are big shoes to awards. feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have our Zebra Walk that is happening virtually right now. We have the in-person in the Carolinas in uh, November, beginning of November. Uh, we have a ton of events coming up, so please make sure you go to netcancerawareness.org and find out where you can get all of that. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you again for having me.